Então, gente, a nossa próxima palestra vai ser dada, vai ser em inglês, vai ser dada pelo Mark Baumer. O Mark Baumer é um desenvolvedor baseado na Suíça. É, ele é, organizou o Workshop de Lua de 2011 e ele tem um trabalho histórico em Lua, com o qual ele vai falar, incluindo uma colaboração com o Lorival do, é, do trabalho anterior de é, scripting do Kernel, que deu, uma, deu origem até uma publicação é, com a Ana, o Lorival e o Roberto no é, DLS de 2014. Então, please, Mark. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about Lua experiences. <clears throat> I'm a long time C developer. I wrote most of my software in C. No, I sh think I should stay here a bit. And that started with a very early BSD operating systems. I think it was for to Reno. And then I did a lot of work on OpenBSD, NetBSD, and also FreeBSD. I'm an active member of the Free Desktop Org, a society that does the X window on Wayland uh, systems. And I'm a company owner. Actually, my company this year turned 30 years old. And we're, we're doing software, obviously. And different uh, software systems, but since about 15 years, we produce point-of-sale systems, that's payment systems, and especially for museums, and they are used all over Switzerland, so we are the company that provides the leading ticketing solution uh, for museums in Switzerland. Of course, uh, they have evolved over the last 15 years, and these point-of-sale systems are scriptable and extensible. I will tell you later in which language. So let's look back. 30 years ago, I was subscribed to Dr. Dobbs' journal. It was then, I would say, the best publication for programmers, Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Calisthenics and Orthodontia, like it was called then. And I had a nice subtitle in the beginning, Running Light Without Overbite. So it means small, fast, not too much uh, overbite there. And I read uh, this article about a new language called Lua, and from that moment I knew it existed, but I did not yet use it. But what I think, running light without overbite, when thinking back 15 years now of almost daily work with Lua, is a very good motto for Lua. So Lua is running light without overbite. I want to first, this confuses me, so. Hmm. I would like to talk a bit about how I got into Lua, how we discovered that, and why we think that was a very good thing. So, 15 years ago, we started developing a brand new point of sale system, and we thought from the beginning, in the end, it should be scriptable, and, but we needed first to have the core product running. We had, like on every average software project, a tight schedule, and a customer that gave us like no time to finish it, so we didn't have uh, a lot of luxury trying out many, many things. So what, what does it look like, or what did it look like at the time? We have uh, a point of sale screen, you see it in the upper right, that's a touchscreen application, graphical user interface with uh, very colorful in this uh, here. It's, uh, it has the same colors up to now. I, nobody ever requested that we change these colors. and. Uh, <laughs> I just took some from which I knew the names, so that's uh, 
how this came. We have uh, customer displays, graphical customers display you see on the lower right. And we have this uh, back office kind of stuff. Uh, we wanted to separate the functionality that you use at the point of sale, namely selling stuff and making all the statistics and all the evaluations and programming the products uh, that we wanted to separate because usually these are different people that do that. Maybe this gets better like this, so I can move around. Um, the back office, so we had a graphical user interface with a touch screen and uh, that's, I will come to that in a while uh, because this begins to involve Lua. And the graphical custom display and this uh, web-based and we decided to use the web technology for the back office. And at these times, we're still using C, C only. And when a request comes in, to the web server from a browser, this request is sent to a server process using a fast CGI interface. Fast, fast CGI is a standard to transmit data from a web server to a daemon process. It's like CGI, just it's a bit faster. The server process then decodes the requests and finds a parameter named OP for operator. And all these OPs, they map to a table of functions and then the corresponding function is being called. It's being handed the rest of the request for processing. And in the end, it will return HTML code, which we send back to the browser delivering a web page. So it's straightforward. It's all in C, and that worked very well, and that still works very well if you know C. And um, my computer displays me everything, just not what I need. Sorry about that. We are back. Okay. Uh, C is very is a nice language. Who in here would say I'm proficient in C? C. <laughs> yes, Roberto. We know that you are proficient in C. <laughs> So, but C actually is a language that you cannot learn, you can only know it, and it's difficult to master. And uh, we being a company, with me being the old guy who did everything in C up until now, but my co-workers, they came from school. They just finished their diploma, whatever, and uh, they had a really rough time with writing these handlers in C. So it can be done, but it doesn't always make sense to do everything just in one language. And uh, because it's not only about uh, producing some HTML code, you also have to do some processing, you have to query a database, uh, do something with the data you retrieve, and uh, then uh, mix the data that you have with the template and send it back, and we use the templating engine, something ill old clear silver in our case but you feel it productivity was low we when when we had to uh, implement a new subsystem it took us weeks if not months and not because those guys didn't know computing or whatever but because we used the wrong tool the wrong language so uh, we sat together and we said <laughs> These handles should actually be written in an easy to learn and easy to use language, in a scripting language, and not necessarily in C. And so I knew I had to integrate a second language into the system. And I had to dispose of this, in retrospect, stupid idea of using only one language, C. 
but to do something in a mixed language environment. And uh, I'm speaking now of the 15 years that we did this point of sales. Of course, I programmed 15 years before as well. And I integrated a lot of languages into C programs, Tickle, Perl, Python, Java. So I knew quite a bit about uh, integrating languages into C programs. And at this point, we said, now we, we stop for a moment and we we really evaluate what will help us, which language will be our sparring partner for the next years, because when we settle for a language, we're probably gonna use it not only for one season. So we carefully re-evaluate everything, and we remember the Lua article, and uh, we made experiments with different languages, of course, nowadays you just take Python. Python comes with everything you need, but Python is big, and Python is object-oriented and C is not. And computing in general is probably not object-oriented. Uh, I have never seen an object-oriented CPU, for example. So in 2008, after careful evaluation, we said, we let the moon shine. And it was this old post about Lua that convinced us that it's really small, like 60K of RAM per interpreter state. It's fast. It's small. It's, we, we really thought that's the language that we need and uh, that fits perfectly with C, easy to integrate. That was our partner for the next year, and still today. So that's how we got into Lua. It was not just because we had Lua, it's because we really evaluated different solutions, and I think we ended up with the best solution for our problem. I, I wouldn't say there's always Lua the best solution for everything, but in our case, it definitely is. So when I enjoyed the prior presentations, I became the impression that Lua is mostly for games, right? Well, what is the point of sale application? The goal is to have a high score every evening. <laughs> so, the business applications we do, and it's our point of sales system. We do web shops, some pretty large web shops of large Swiss universities use our software, which is based on Lua, or is written entirely in Lua. And these are among the fastest web shops that exist. And when we did that for the Zurich School of Arts, the director came to me after uh, this web shop went into production. He said, damn, this is so fast. Can you do that for our main website too? So we have these online ticketing systems. We uh, to the Swiss Museum Pass. In Switzerland, you can buy a pass for a little bit of money. It's not very expensive. And then you get free entrance to over 600 museums in Switzerland. Switzerland has the most museums per capita in Europe. We have over 1,200 museums in Switzerland. And when you go with your pass to a museum, it will be scanned with a hand scanner this hand scanner makes a connection to our data center where an API is running. And now guess what? This API is written in Lua. So we have thousands of museum entries every day that are handled in real time using Lua software. And I always or often read on the mailing list, 
Lua, that's not a language for large-scale applications. You cannot do business with uh, business applications with Lua. Lua is for scripting games. Uh, that's only something an init in uninitiated pe person can say. Lua is perfect for doing such applications. And you can go to any post office in Switzerland and buy such a museum pass, and the person at the counter will use to sell you this pass uh, an application that is written in Lua. So all post offices in Switzerland use this too. But I must admit the way to get there was a bit steep at first. But uh, if we think about it, when we do business applications that involve a lot of data processing like we do, then tables are everywhere. Data in a database is organized in tables, at least if it's a relational database. Data in Lua is obviously organized in tables because there's nothing else available. And on a web page, sometimes we display data as tables. And uh, of course, there was Lua SQL, this interface uh, to interface databases. And, uh, but this was not perfect for us, although it's definitely good. But we use a lot of advanced feature of PostgreSQL. We use PostgreSQL databases since ever, <laughs> actually since before it was even named PostgreSQL. And so we needed something to use that meaning we had a lot of missing pieces. We needed a way to query Postgres database from Lua to get the database into Lua. We needed a way to mix Lua data with a template, a template engine. And we needed to get those fast CGI working into Lua. And possible, or in retrospect, I know, a lot more. So, one of the questions when you use a database is, are you going for DB agnostic or DB specific? And if you're going for DB agnostic, you can only use uh, the common subset of all databases, which is probably not all too much. And if you decide to go for a certain database, be it MySQL or whatever product you choose, then you can use all the advanced features, but then you need a specific binding to that database. So as we use a feature that's called asynchronous notifications from PostgreSQL a lot, um, we had to first invent a Lua PGSQL module, which we did. And then it came to templating, we wanted uh, a nice templating engine, something fast. And uh, why don't you take PHP? It has been around for ages. Yes, um, if you don't reinvent the wheel, we would still uh, drive around on, on bumpy rocks. So that's why we first defined a very nice syntax. And instead of PHP, code, uh, our templating system, of course, can uh, use Lua code on the page. So we kind of mix Lua code and the template uh, expressions. And this way, we have a, a really nice Lua-based templating engine. By the way, all this is open source. Uh, if you're interested, you'll find it. And. On a front end, we wanted to use a kind of declarative style user interface uh, programming. Ima imagine that. We did declarati declarative user interfaces 15 years ago. Apple announced it like three years ago. <laughs> so that gave us in the first phase of our work uh, on, on working on this product, we developed a lot of 
necessary modules like a binding to motive, a ancient graphical user interface system, to the Postgres database and to uh, decoders and encoders for JSON data format, for YAML and for uh, web sockets. And whenever we met a requirement, we wrote the uh, corresponding Lua module. And we have a lot that are fancy, to say the least, like talking to uh, credit card terminals over very uh, weird protocols, but we can do all this in Lua. We even did some nasty things. We did our own Lua loader um, because uh, <laughs> we were a bit worried about our intellectual property, to be honest. So we decided to not only compile to bytecode, but be even more evil and encrypt this bytecode. So our software on disk is just random noise. And so we don't even use the standard I.O. library to load this code, but we directly map this into the address space of the process. So we do so-called memory map call. And then we decrypt it on the fly in memory and retrieve the original bytecode, which we hand to the Lua loader. So this is what we do uh, all the time, up until to, even until today. Uh, it works so good, we don't notice anything, we just left it in place. Um, after 15 years and nobody's trying to steal the software, we could revise this decision. So that's what we had to do. It was mainly writing a lot of modules. And, but then productivity went like it was. It's now very easy to write new stuff to extend the software and uh, do all these things. Okay. In the subtitle of my presentation, I <laughs> mentioned something that you probably think is a bit weird: supporting elephants. <laughs> But we did, and it's actually about pretty low-level stuff that I would be talking. So a zoo decided to make a new enclosure for African elephants. Huh? There exist African elephants and Asian. And I talked in Stockholm how they live, and I will not uh, <laughs> do this here again. But they made a new enclosure for these elephants and they wanted to promote this a bit and they had the idea to build a machine, a rock that collects money and by putting in coins you became a patron of an elephant. And of course the goal was to get like 2,000 patrons in no time. And it has two coin rejectors for funny reasons, these are not called coin acceptors, but coin rejectors. And there's one for adults and one for children. And the adults have to put in two coins to become a pattern, and children could just put in one coin. And the number of patterns was displayed on this large display, but also on the web page of the zoo. And when you threw in a coin, it had to update in real time, not only on the display, but also on the website. And this was controlled by a little computer that was installed in the rock, and that used a lot of Lua. Yes, here you see it. So, we decided to do a, a really uh, um, traditional design of the software. We have um, 
to the left our devices, the display, the two coin rejectors, uh, the engine X web server for displaying the, the number. And we have in um, LILAC the modules that we wrote uh, to uh, control a coin rejector. They use a protocol called CC Talk. And so we made a Lua module CC Talk that allows us to control all these uh, cache machines um, from Lua. We reuse the fast CGI and the PGSQL modules to connect to the database. And for each device, we run a separate Lua process, and they're all connected to the same PostgreSQL uh, databases. And I mentioned before these asynchronous notifications. Now, the, the trick is that an update to the database on the database server creates an asynchronous notification which is asynchronously sent to those processes that listen for changes. So when one process updates something in the database, the other processes get notified that there was a change and can retrieve the current value. So the database that looks pretty big here. Actually, it's the smallest database that Earth has ever seen. It contains one table with one number, namely the count of patterns. Uh, I made a live demo of this in Stockholm, but the rock doesn't exist anymore, so I can't do any more live demos. I can only talk about it, but uh, this talk is, yeah, is about experiences, so that's okay. We did not only um, do this rock, elephants, they must be weighed regularly to see if they're in a, in a good health. And if they lose weight too, uh, too fast, then, you, then, then you, they know there is something wrong with this animal and they need to take it to the doctor. So. Uh, we got uh, the challenge to build a second machine that was a scale to weigh elephants. I mean, when in your world do you get the opportunity to create a computerized way to weigh elephants? So this was also a funny project. And they wanted to have a large display in the visitor room. So when the uh, cl clerks put the elephant on the scale, people could see how heavy this animal is, actually. So we designed all this machinery. The way is, this is large plates, like four plates big as one of these tables. Uh, and the elephants, they trample on it. And then we get from the sensors the values. So we calculate the weight, we display it, and Although we are a small company, since this event, we say we are into large-scale software development. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel it. My, my work in Lua is mostly circling around C API, writing bindings, writing modules, so that we can use Lua for the most weird things, um, like weighing elephants. And recently, after I did this for more than 10 years, I thought now it's time to sort a little bit my thoughts on this, on, on uh, putting stuff into Lua and to making uh, stuff uh, accessible from Lua and to extend Lua and uh, to, yeah, to document what I have done so far. Uh, and that's how the Lua integration guide was born, which is meant to be a practical guide to the Lua C API. And you find this online. Oh. Why does this not show up? It's 
so. This doesn't work as I expected. Okay. You'll find that online on the lua.msys.ch and it's available online in HTML form as a PDF or uh, as an EPUB. And it, oops, this is a bit difficult to navigate. And you see it covers all the topics that, in my opinion, are important when you use the Lua C API uh, from making C software available to Lua, making Lua software available to C, uh, writing uh, how to make new bindings, and uh, a lot of other stuff uh, up to the most recent um, to be closed variables how to implement this in C. So it covers the aspects that I had, I was challenged with when, when, when doing my work with uh, Lua. So if you are really into my experiences or want to know what I experienced when doing all this, this you find in the, in the uh, Lua integration guide. And okay. That's the URL. Okay. Now for something completely different. Do we have any amateur radio operators in the room? Not too much. One, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about transceiver control. That's the part with the shortwave transmitters. And here you see me and Vera operating at the 2023 SSB Field Day contest in Switzerland. And we made fourth rank by seven participants. <laughs> 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 but nevertheless, uh, I want to tell you how this works. So if you're a radio amateur or a ham radio operator, you're allowed to use certain parts of the high frequency spectrum uh, for to transmit in various operating modes, uh, single sideband, amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and so forth. And that's an interesting hobby because we can easily make a on shortwave a connection from Switzerland to Brazil uh, over radio. Um, and we were contesting. In a contest, you operate for 24 hours in a row, making as much contacts as possible, and every contact gives you points. And if the, po uh, if the contact is in Brazil, it gives you more points, because it's further away, it's more difficult to work. And if you only make a contact to Germany, that's a neighboring country, that gives you less points. So it's really important to make in 24 hours or even 48 hours as much uh, contacts as possible. And of course, you operate in teams because sometimes you need some sleep. And what we did here, I was operating, I was operating the radio and Vera was trying to decode the call signs because this is not hi-fi stereo what you get on shortwave. This is more like <laughs> so it's you have to have a good ear and to listen to these call signs and these call signs they are not Luis Valdemar or Roberto. There are like PI6AF, HP9SSB, DFO0VGV. And trust me, they give these call signs as fast as they can, uh, because that's cool. So 
Whereas try to pick up the call sign and then tell me, listen, on 14285 uh, kilohertz you can listen, PI, well, whatever. And then I can operate this station. So two people, one is only deciphering call signs, the other is operating. This is suboptimal. We need two transceivers and one is listening and one is operating. We call this search and pounce and running. And uh, why am I telling you that? Because of, we wanted to write a piece of software so that the, the monitoring station, whenever she hears a call sign, she enters the call sign on a keyboard and taps enter, and the software will retrieve the operating mode and frequency from the transceiver and put this in a waiting queue. And the operating system has a separate display where I see all the incoming entries on the queue from the monitor station, and I can just tap it, and it will control my transceiver to this frequency and operating mode, and I see the call sign, and I can immediately call these stations. Now, if there is no entries in the queue, I have my set of running frequencies. Then I tap one of these, it will program my transceiver and um, to this operating mode and frequency where I, myself, will now call for other stations. We call this a CQ call. CQ, CQ, or whatever. So it means I'm looking for a contact. So we want to be way more productive in contesting. And so we designed a software. Uh, obviously, Lua will be involved a bit, or a fair bit. And this is. Op uh, completely developed in the open, and I want to show you quickly the concept. I don't see it on my screen here, so I have to turn around. So the idea is to have a software here, it's called uh, TRXD, the, that's the controller part that has an uh, uh, infinite number of clients that can connect and an infinite number of transceivers. By the way, transceiver is an artificial word and it uh, means transmitter and receiver. So then we have the GPIO pins of the machine we run on. We have the antenna rotators so that we can direct our antennas. And we have relays that we can control. And the typical situation we then have, we have the monitoring client, the operating client, a logging software, we have the monitor transceiver we use, the operating transceiver, and maybe a display client for bystanders so that I can see what we are doing. What? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I see it. <laughs> I was scared <laughs> all the time now. <laughs> okay. So let's continue this with finding the mouse first. Good. So what did we do? We decided that this is going to be a multi-threaded application. Uh, multi-threading means complicated. And we have this process, the TRXD daemon process. Uh, it consists of a thread named client handler. There is one such thread for each client that connects to this uh, software. Then we have the TRX controller thread. There is one for each transceiver that run. We usually have more than one. Uh, then we have uh, for each transceiver a polar. Not all transceivers can send their status updates automatically, so we have to poll them. 
That's another threat that we call into the controller. Get me the frequency, please. Or if you have a modern transceiver that sends this data automatically, we have a transceiver handler that receives data and hands it to the controller for decoding, because this, of course, is machine-specific. So this is a heavily distributed system. And each handler now is a threat with its own Lua state. Because we think if Lua has helped us so much in the past, Lua here will help a lot if people want to use this system. And at the lowest level, here we have the drivers for the different transceivers, rotators, and whatever, and they are written in Lua. Small pieces of Lua to drive the transceiver, and a rather complex compositum of threads that operates everything so that it's totally asynchronous and fast. So this way, it's very easy to support a new transceiver. Similar software, of course, existed, but not done this way, not done with Lua. And uh, so this is a, a rather new project of mine, and it's starting to work really well. Uh, this idea of having uh, one Lua state per thread seems to pay out and seems to be a good thing. So um, it, it was actually the idea before we did this to um, try if we can make Lua distributed, if we can uh, make a distributed Lua environment. And um, this little hobby project was the guinea pig project. Here we, here we could try it out uh, without uh, bringing our commercial stuff into danger. This is our hobby project, our hobby software, and but it worked good. And so I come to the topic, the need for speed. I am totally sure, convinced, that a mixed language development paradigm can beat a single line, single language approach with a just-in-time compiler. When <laughs> Language has become too slow for a certain task. Often comes a just-in-time compiler into play. A prominent example of this is Java. Java is a heavy language and uh, has a rather lame bytecode when, uh, when executed directly. So uh, they decided early on we need a just-in-time compiler to make this beast at least a little bit faster. And it means sticking with one language and trying to make it faster. And Lua, in my opinion, offers a way more interesting possibility with its C API. So while Lua, with its cooperative multi-threading or multitasking that it has, uh, the coroutines, coroutine features, um, you can do really great stuff with that if you do it right. Um, but it still runs on one CPU core. And you can make it fast by using a just-in-time compiler which still run on one core. So it will use one core just a bit faster. And if you have a big machine with 64 or more cores, uh, you will run on one of these and uh, 63 will idle around. So uh, nobody hinders us to run many, many states independently, each on its own thread. And as these threads are distributed over all cores, suddenly we are using the whole machine. So instead of just making execution faster, we distribute the execution. Of course, this means probably a different approach at designing the software to make it <coughs> parallel from the beginning. But 
<coughs> it can be done. So these Lua states, they're running in its each in its own thread. They're completely independent of other states. And uh, we're using POSIX threads uh, for, for this. And that means that you have to be very careful to synchronize access to these uh, Lua states. We have uh, uh, synchronization issues. Um, uh, we need to use these mutexes to protect a state so that only one client can access it. And the current challenge we are facing, so I'm talking now about work in progress that I'm actually uh, doing since some time now. A challenge is the communication between the nodes, between the Lua nodes, um, how to give them workloads and how to retrieve the results back. Uh, so it's very similar to what we do in our transceiver control software, but it's in a generic way. So it's made for generic computing, and we have a use case for that. And I hope to get this system ready in the next year, uh, because uh, it will be the future for our applications. So we're currently investigating, should we communicate over a software bus, or should we pass parameters to the, to the state and retrieve the results? And then there is also the question about a scheduler. We somehow need to keep track which Lua states are ready to accept work and which are already working so that we can dispatch workloads to the Lua states that are ready to run uh, uh, something. And we created a sub-project called Microbus. A, a Microbus is a software bus where you can subscribe to events or generate events. And this runs in the, in the address space of the process with the many threads. And also, it can communicate over TCP IP. So if you have several processes running, each with several threads, they can communicate over process boundaries. And using TCP IP, they can even communicate over uh, machine boundaries. So what we're trying to achieve is to enjoy pure Lua, but distribute it. And no uh, fiddling around with JIT or other hacks. So the execution node stays Lua as it is. And this is work in progress. So, seven advantages of Lua based on 15 years of working with the language. This language evolves in ways that make sense. There's no feature creep. Look what Python added in the last 15 years, or what Java did in computer crime in the last 15 years. And now look what Lua did. Carefully, they added good stuff, like recently those to be closed variables. They're very good for us because we do a lot of database transactions. When we do tens of thousands of database transactions, we always end up with, end up with allocated memory that eventually gets garbage collected. With to be closed, we can now control when this memory is released. So the memory pressure of our applications, like our high volume web shops, they went like down. So the team is very cautious when it makes changes, if at all. And thank goodness they do not listen to the outside world. No, really, this way we, we get a language that works, that is well engineered. It is small and it comes with a minimal yet functional set of libraries. It's just what you need. And what you 
need and it's not there, you can do it easily because the C API, it really stands out. And there are no, as they say on the mailing list, batteries included. Uh, Python comes with batteries included. Uh, modern Python, it would, I would say, comes even with a diesel generator. <laughs> so Lua is still the small engine that you can embed everywhere. Lua is scripting how it has to be done. Small, fast, powerful, extensible, you have a C program, you put Lua in it. This will not bloat your program. It will still stay small, but it will gain functionality. And you can make the most complicated stuff, stuff like talking to coin rejectors or whatever. You can make it available to people who only use Lua. And I don't mean that in a, uh, in a bad way, but Lua is easy to learn. You can find easily a person who can do work for you if they can do it in Lua. And I think uh, what also an advantage is, is that Lua provides mechanisms and not policies. Lua does not tell me how I have to solve a certain problem or how, how I have to do something. But it provides me the mechanism so that I can do it like I want it. So uh, in my opinion, these are the seven big advantages of using these languages. <laughs> of course, there are a few things that also could bother me a bit, but they're not even worth their own slide. That's newbies to the language, they come very often to the mailing list and suggest a spectacular change in the language, like this is bad, this has not to be done in this way, and um, yeah, after one week at most, there comes an email, can we now please go back discussing Lua again? <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe the adoption rate of current Lua, with current Lua I mean what Pook sees as the current Lua 5.4.6, the adoption rate is maybe a bit slow. You still see a lot of software that's stuck at 5.1 level, but I think they miss cool new stuff. And uh, yeah, probably not much we can do about that. So, I want to thank you for your attention, and especially I want to take the opportunity to thank the Lua team for creating this perfect language, and not only for creating it, but also for making it available, and congratulations to 30 years of perseverance. Characteristic of the languages, of the problem? No, uh, not really. We want when when Lua introduced the um, duality of integers and floating point numbers. At one point, first there was just one numeric type, and then at one point they switched to uh, two different or two two sub subtypes. That caused caused us for a short moment a bit of problems because um, numbers were not treated like they were before, and uh, they were formatted differently in some cases. So, But I would not say this is a problem with Lua, that is a problem with us not being careful enough in uh, reading the change log. Um, at 
the beginning of the talk, you said that one of the reasons you switched to Lua was that it was a faster development for your uh, developers. So what is it that, like, what are some specific things about Lua that make it better for developers uh, instead of other languages like it? Well, the, historically we used the C language, huh? So it was C that we had to replace. And if you don't know C, it's rather hard to program in C. And to learn it is also hard because with the, with the manual memory uh, management and everything, you can easily shoot in your own foot. And uh, Lua uh, having automatic memory management and uh, um, easy to learn syntax, it made, uh, made it a lot easier for those people to um, to program, uh, in this case, it was these handlers for the web-based software. So I think it's because the language itself is easier to learn and easier to understand. Of course, you can do very sophisticated things, but you don't have to. You can start simple. And that's why it gave us a productivity boost, because it was so much easier for them to work with Lua than also, debugging is easier. I mean, a C program, you have to compile it first, and a Lua program, you can just run it quickly and change it quickly, and it's a, it's a more agile process, developing Lua. But then, why switch to, from C to Lua and not, like, what is it about Lua instead of, say, Java or uh, another language? Well, now we're starting politics. Um, <laughs> We, we write our software using the VI editor, by the way, not Emacs. And uh, it's very easy. Lua fits uh, this procedural programming model that C has. So it's a perfect addition to it. And now compare the size of the Java engine with the Lua engine. It's, much, it's substantial. And then Java being object-oriented, uh, Python being object-oriented, uh, it's a lot more of management code to create an object, to give, to give the Java programmer the impression he is working in a, a Java uh, environment, but on the C side, that's a pain. And with Perl, it's even funnier. Uh, Perl has this, uh, has this uh, feature that at a certain moment, it will instantiate tons of objects and it will ex let the memory usage explode. So that's, and Tickle, it's a nice language, but uh, it's all strings, so it's boring. <laughs> I was curious about your concern with security regarding the memory mapping files and not using the I.O. library. Maybe I didn't understand that well, but I was going to ask this question. If you don't use the I.O. library, but you call mmap, you're also using the C library. So if you don't <coughs> trust one part of the library, why do you trust the other? Could you explain that again? It's, it's not about trust in the library. It's just about um, that we need to have the whole file in memory anyway to, uh, to decode it. So the trust is more not trusting our customers, not the libraries. So it has nothing to do with, per with uh, performance, just a different way. I mean, under the hood, the standard library will memory map the file eventually too. So we did it right up. So it's for practical reasons, not for security reasons. The security feature is that the code on disk is encrypted, not that we use memory mapping. Maybe one last question for the break. Yeah. And where, where you put your keys to decrypt? You have a secret there? That's the best kept secret of our company. <laughs> I especially won't tell you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's thank Martin. Thank you very much for coming.